we're, we're starting this series, I want to believe, but. Right? I want to believe, but. And over these next few weeks, we're just going to explore these common barriers, these common struggles, these common questions that kind of hinder us and keep us from growing closer and closer to God. And it's one of those series that we're excited about because if you are currently not struggling with that, we probably used to, or hopefully you're having conversations with people outside of here, and this is where they're at. And so what I want to do is I want to pray, and then we're going to jump right into the first week. So let's pray. God, thank you again just for this morning, and as we just sang, God, I pray that you help move us closer to your love as we step farther away from fear. God, a lot of these questions, a lot of these struggles, a lot of these barriers are rooted in fear. And God, we are just praying that you give us the strength to take one small step towards you, right? One small step towards your love, one small step towards your presence, God. And I pray that you would bring other people, men and women and kids, into our lives to encourage us and to walk with us as we grow closer and closer to you. And so, God, I just pray Again, as I pray often, that you would quiet our hearts, you would quiet our thoughts, you would get rid of any distractions, anything in the way that might keep us from hearing from you, your word, and your Holy Spirit. And I just pray that we would be different. We would be changed because of your spirit, right? Because of the power that we're going to read in and through your word. So continue to be with us now. Help everything that is said to bring honor and glory to you. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today we are talking about this idea that I want to believe, but I don't feel like I belong, right? I, I don't feel like I belong. Like I see this and I hear these things and it sounds good, but I just don't think that's for me. And I started to think about this thought and I think there's a couple different ways, right? This is the first one. God might love me, but his people definitely don't. And I know that can be true for so many of us because if, if I'm looking around this room, I know a lot of us right here have some church hurt, right? I know God loves me, but his people, they're a whole different story. And so many of us have been hurt by people inside of the church, and that hurt makes us believe that we don't belong here, let alone with God at all. Right? It's a very real pain. And I think what happens is if we've been hurt, what do we do? We choose to stay away. Most people don't run towards pain willingly. right? And so it, we, we get pushed away. And some people, they don't ever step foot in the church again. right? They've experienced that pain and they're like, nope, I'm out. But then I think another part of that that is so scary is they do come to church, but they build up these walls. right? And, and they're in a crowd but they're all alone. And, and that's what we want to talk about today, right? A little bit is we don't want you just to be here and be gone, right? We want you to be involved. We want you to be connected. We want you to know that you belong here because you belong to God. And, and I think there's other people's, like the other side of this coin, I started thinking, man, I want to believe, but I want to believe, but I don't belong. And I'm thinking, I think there's a deeper issue when you say something like that, I think there's a foundational issue and it comes out like, I want to believe, but I don't think God could ever love someone like me, right? And I want you to, to see this for a second. They're going to leave it up for just a minute, but I want to believe, right? I want to believe, but God could never use someone like me. God could never be impacted, right? I could never do what some of you guys do because I know me. And so I want to believe, right? I really want to believe in God. But I don't think he could ever love someone like me. And what happens is when you start to believe that lie, what happens? Well, if God could never love someone like me, then surely the church could never love someone like me. And so I'm just going to stay away from it all together. Because if I could never belong to God, I could never belong to a church, I could never have community, I could never have a family. And what happens is that's the enemy's win, right? He keeps you alone, isolated, and as we talked about last week with Jason, right, he knows he can't have you, but he will rob you, right? He's going to rob you of every experience. I, I was listening to something this week, and the speaker said, 
Do you know that your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, the people at work, they need you to be who God created you to be so that they could be who God created them to be? And I thought about that and thought about that and thought about that. And I said, man, what would I do if I was trying to get them away from that? And it's this. God could never love someone like you. And it's easy to feel like that, right? If I said, hey, raise your hand if you've ever felt like that, most of us would say that. But here's something that I want to tell you. It's not about what you feel. It's about what you know, right? And what do we know? We know that Scripture is true and what Scripture say. It's full of broken people being used by God all the time. If, if you've been around the faith for a long time, you'll see a thing like, hey, Jacob was a liar and he was a drunk. And it goes all the way through all of these broken people and it ends with Lazarus. And you know what he was? Dead. And so it covers the gamut. It used to be one of my favorite things to look at because it's like God, God really can use anyone and everyone because Scripture's full of broken people. And we know from Scripture it's God's desire for every single person to be saved, right? For all of us to belong to the family of God. And I love John, right? John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He wrote in the book of John and in 1 John, I want to share two verses with you. John 1.12 says this. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, right? To all, any and every one of us have this opportunity to receive him. And if we do, he says, hey, you're a child of God. And then in 1 John chapter 3, this is what he says, see what great love, what great love the father has lavished, and that's such a fun word, lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And then, just in case we miss it, that is what we are. So again, any and every one of us, right, we all have the opportunity to belong, and not only to belong, but literally to be adopted into the family of God. And so we know that's true. So how do we wrestle with, well, I feel like that could never be me. I, I feel like that couldn't be me, could God really love someone like me? And if you've ever wondered or doubted if God loves you, right, if you've ever searched for affirmation and approval, then this is the day I want you to pay attention because we're going to dive in and we're going to look at Luke 8 and we're going to look at a story of two daughters. And these stories are in all of the Gospels, but we're going to focus on Luke 8 and we're going to read a good chunk of scripture starting in verse 40. And so I'm going to read a few verses and we'll talk about it. Okay. Luke 8 verse 40. When Jesus returned, right, this is, he returned from legion, right? So he took all the demons out of legion, put them into pigs. They ran into the ocean. Legion's like, hey, Jesus, can I come with you? Jesus is like, nope, I need you to hang out. He gets back in the boat, right? So they're on like a, a good spiritual high. When Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him, right? It's a lake. They saw Jesus go across. They know he has to come back. They come back. The crowd is waiting. Verse 41. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. And we see why in verse 42. Because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. Right? And so... If you're a parent in the room, this makes a lot of sense to you, right? If your kid is hurt and struggling, you move heaven and earth to take care of them, right? And so Jairus, this earthly father, father, his daughter is dying, and he does what any good dad would do, right? He humbles himself and throws himself at the feet of Jesus. But think about this. What kind of man was he? He was a Jewish leader, right? It says he was a leader of the synagogue. And we can't just skip over this fact, because if you read all throughout Scripture, which people didn't really get along with Jesus? The religious leaders, right? And so this man risked everything. He doesn't just be like, hey, Jesus, can, you, can we get a quick conversation? He hits the floor, humbles himself completely, could lose his job, could lose his reputation. Everything that he has ever been, right, as an older man, drop into this, his knees of a younger man and says, I need your help. I've heard these stories, and I want to believe, but, right? And he could have easily, easily felt like that because you think of a situation. If there's anyone in the room that doesn't belong with Jesus, who is it? His enemy, right? This guy whose whole life, 
ever since Jesus stepped on the scene, he's like, we got to stop this guy. We got to shut this guy down. He's changing everything, right? If he felt like he didn't belong, we would relate to that very easy, right? Maybe he's walking up thinking, why would Jesus ever help a guy like me? Right? He knows my friends. He knows what we're about. He knows my coworkers. He knows all the things we've done. And if the stories are true, he even knows the things we're thinking about doing. And he says, no, 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 no. I need help. So instead of believing that lie that he doesn't belong there, what's he do? And I, I love this picture, right? He throws himself where? At the feet of Jesus. And this is what I love. What does Jesus say? Okay, let's go. They start walking. There's not a conversation. There's not a debate. What's well, hey, if you change your life, I guess I'll follow you. Jesus says, okay. And so what do they do? They start walking. Right? And so in this moment, you guys know me. My, my, my brain is like a movie. So Jesus and Jairus, they're walking. They're heading home. Jairus is feeling pretty good. Like, hey, Jesus is going to come. If all these stories are true, my daughter's going to be okay. But if you know scripture, what happens? Jesus stops. Right? Jesus stops. So I'm going to, let's read a few more verses. Right? The end of verse 42 is Jesus is on his way. The crowds almost crushed him. Right? So pushing in. They want to be near him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And she spent all she had on doctors. Right? But no one could heal her. Right, so 12 years, she's got this issue, she's got this struggle, no one can heal her. Verse 44, she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. And then I love this question, right? Verse 45, who touched me, Jesus said. Who touched me, Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people... They're crowding and pressing against you, right? So Peter's like, Jesus, everyone's touching you. And Jesus knows, no, 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 there's a difference between being close and being touched, right? There's a difference. But Jesus said, no, 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 someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell where? At his feet. And in the presence of all the people, the very same people she was hiding from, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then Jesus says this in verse 48, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Right? And so Jairus is like, hey, you're going to heal my daughter. You're going to heal my daughter. And someone touches Jesus' jacket. And he's like, wait a second, we got to stop. Right, we got to stop. And Jairus is probably pretty confused, right? If, if you say, hey, I need your help, and I said, okay, let's go do it, but then I stop, what are you instantly going to think, right? And, and this is just my brain. I think Jesus is pranking me like, oh, great. He knew I was a Jewish leader. He knew I was this religious guy. So he got all my hopes up, and he's going to be like, hey, man, love you, bye. You want to kill me? One for one, eye for an eye. See you later. Your daughter's not going to make it. And Jesus would never say something like that, but isn't it true that when we expect God to do something and we ask God to do something and it starts to slightly go differently, what do we instantly jump to? Worst case scenario. And so I have to believe that Jairus is very similar to us, right? But Jesus knows something that Jairus is about to learn. Waiting time is not wasted time, right? Waiting time is not wasted time. And so Jesus starts to do something. And I think the same thing that he was teaching him, he's trying to teach all of us, right? Something doesn't go the way we thought or the way we expected. And what do we start to do? We start to doubt God, right? I want to believe God. I want to believe, but, right? We start to believe a lie. And what happens is that lie is, I believe that God doesn't really love me. If he loved me, if he really cared about me, then why does fill in the blank? And, and I get that. Like, we can relate to that. If, if I, my daughter was sick and Jesus stopped, like, that's the most important thing to me in that moment. And Jesus is like, no, someone touched me. And just like, there's people all around you. Everyone is touching you. They're rubbing shoulders with you. They're brushing up against you. Who, who cares if someone touched you? Let's keep going. But here's what happens, right? He's about to learn something that hopefully all of us know, right? If we, we ever get to that feeling, God doesn't love me, God doesn't love me, we know this. What does Romans 5, 8 say? 
Right? Romans 5.8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us when? While we were still sinners. Right? And so Jairus is about to learn this just like us. So you look at these two daughters. There's a lot of similarities. you got a 12-year-old daughter who is sick and dying. Right? Life is slipping away. And then you got a woman who has been suffering for 12 years. 12 years she is bleeding and she spends all her money to try to find a cure. All this money on doctors. Because of her disease and this Jewish culture, she was considered unclean, which basically means she can't touch anybody or anything, right? Anything she touches is instantly dirty, unclean, and they have to go through this whole purification process, right? And so I want you to think about this. This lady... This woman, this daughter, goes 12 years without the basic need of human touch, right? She's not been hugged. No one has held her hand. No one has put their arm on her shoulder. She has not been kissed by a family member. She has had no human contact, no love. 12 years of being completely abandoned and let down over and over and over. And so I asked this question, how come she didn't do what Jairus did? How come she didn't come right to Jesus and throw herself at his feet? I think it's easy. She was alone, right? What did Jairus do? The daughter didn't come and throw herself at the feet of Jesus because she couldn't. She had a father who stepped in and did it for her. And this woman has been alone. She has been unnoticed. She's been isolated her whole life. And so her story makes perfect sense. She sneaks in through the crowd, right, crawling on her hands and knees. Ironically, every single person she is touching is becoming unclean, but they have no idea that she's even there because they're just brushing and they're trying to get close to these, Jesus, and she's just trying to get close enough and get close enough even though she's all alone. And again, I started reading this story, and I'm like, have you ever felt all alone? Like there was no one out there for you. Because here's what I know, just like that woman, we all have wounds that need healing, right? Some are physical, some are emotional, and some are spiritual. And that healing comes when we experience the love of God. And she knew that, right? She said, if I could just touch, I don't even need to see him. I don't even need to speak him. I know that he is who he says he is. And if I just touch his clothes, everything will be good. But there's a lesson from this lady that I want us to know, right? And it's this, we want God to heal us privately so that we can act fine publicly, right? Most of us, we don't want to come and be like, here's my mess, here's who I am, here's where I'm struggling. What do we do? We beg God, just heal me privately, heal me privately, right? Why? So I can act like everything is okay publicly. And you guys know this, right? My wife and I were guilty of this. We would fight. We used to have a long drive to church. Now it's shorter, and thankfully I come earlier, so we've never fought on the way to church. I can honestly say that in three years we have never fought on the way to Northridge Community Church because we don't drive together. <laughs> Write that down. But we would argue, and we, what would happen? we walk in the church. How are you, Justin? Great, blessed, highly favored. Why is your face red? <laughs> you know, I was hot in the car. Why is your wife's face red? Looks like she's been crying. Oh, allergies. You know, we live in East Tennessee. The mountains be crushing us. But we would just pretend, right? And, and you guys know that. Who walks in and be like, well, actually, we're doing terrible. We, fought, we love each other, but we don't like each other right now. Can't wait to sit through your message. Okay, see you. Bye. Don't talk to me anymore, right? We don't talk like that. We're not real like that. But what would happen if we were? We just ask God, hey, God, we've been fighting in the car. We're about to walk into church. We don't want to give off a bad image, a bad vibe. We don't want to. So just, just heal us right here, right? We, we hide, and we ask God to heal us privately so that we can act fine publicly. But Jesus senses this about the woman, and he stops, and he asks the question. And here's, the, here's an idea for you today, right? God can't get glory from a story that you are unwilling to tell. And so what does he do, right? He asks this question because he knows God can't get glory from a story you're unwilling to tell. She touched him and was instantly healed. What did she try to do? Just crawl right back out of the crowd and move on. But Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. who touched me? And how many of you know that question was for one person, right? Jesus asked a question, and you know when it's to you. She could feel it in her core, 
And Peter, he tries to brush it off, right? Good old Peter. Jesus, there's lots of people touching you. Let's keep it moving, right? Keep it moving. Keep the line moving, right? It's like he's at the amusement park. Keep it moving, right? TSA line. Let's go. Keep it going. Peter brushes it off. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. Listen, somebody touched me. And Peter said, no, they were just brushing against you. He said, no, 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 no. not brushed against me. Someone reached out to me, and I know it. Why? Because he wants us to learn, right? God can't get glory from a story you're unwilling to tell. And so what does Jesus do? He's willing to make her feel uncomfortable. Because what's he do? Who touched me? And what's she do? She comes trembling because she wants to be unnoticed. And how many of us have been there, right? I just want to be invisible. I just want to come. I just want to hear the word of God. I don't want anyone to get close to my wounds. I just want to love Jesus and leave. And Jesus is like, no, 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 who touched me? And she comes crawling back up. And this is beautiful because Jesus wanted to heal her physically, but he also wanted to heal her relationally, emotionally, and spiritually. This is something that's so cool to me. Do you know that this woman is the only woman Jesus ever calls daughter his entire time recorded in Scripture? It's this lady. And so I started thinking about that. Why? Why now? Why her? You've talked to tons of women, right? You've, you've listened to women. You've shared that you're the Messiah with the woman at the well. Like, you've done some amazing things. Why this unnamed woman? Why did you tell her daughter? Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And I think it's because even more than physical healing, she hadn't been loved, right? Affirmed. She hadn't been shown any sort of affection in 12 years. And Jesus looks at her, and I can just imagine this, right? My movie. The whole scene, there's tons and tons of people, and Jesus locks eyes, and it's like, you, daughter, we're the only two people here. Your faith has healed you. And then he says, go in peace. And this word peace, you've heard, is shalom. And it, it understands this completeness, this wholeness, Right, So when he's like, go in peace, it's not just like, hey, peace be with you, you're healed. You are made whole. Everything that you have been missing, you wanted to believe, but you couldn't. Right? There was this fear. There was this doubt. I just want to sneak in and sneak out. Jesus says, no, 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 come, come, come. And she comes, and she falls at his feet, and he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Jesus steps in and does what no one else can in that moment, right? She's no longer alone. She is seen. She is valued. She is loved. And I got to tell you, just like Jesus sees her, he sees you, right? And some of us, we do the same thing. I I just want to come to church. I just want to read. I just want to worship, and I just want to leave, And I got to tell you, like, that's not the goal. Why? Because God can't get glory from a story that you're unwilling to tell. I know that most of us have been hurt. I know that some of us still live in the pain of church hurt. But that hurt's never going to go away unless you take a step towards it. Right? God can't get glory from a story you're unwilling to tell. And I just need you to know that Jesus sees you. Right? He sees when you come in. He sees when you go. And he's like, man, I've put you at this place for you to get connected, for you to find your community. If there was any takeaway from the last five weeks, anything that brought me to tears, you can ask Chris. I'm not a huge crier. Chris is not a huge crier. We read testimony after testimony of people saying, man, I found real community here that I didn't think was possible. And that is what I want for you, but I think that's what God wants for each and every one of us is not to be isolated, not to be alone, not to crawl through the crowd hoping to be unnoticed, but to come together and we still end up at the same place at his feet. No embarrassment, no shame. I don't know if you guys pay attention to shirts, but Callie that's right here had an awesome shirt on today. It said, your brokenness is welcome here. And I'm thankful that her arms were long enough that she could play guitar and you could still see it because that is the truth. Because we know this, right? You can sit in a crowd and still be all alone. And, and like I said, that's how some of us treat church, and we want to break that. We want to destroy that. We don't want you to sit here and be alone. We want you to know that you are seen, you are loved, you are valued. And so just like Jesus, he did three things. And I want to remind you of those things so that you can experience the same love 
that this unnamed woman, this daughter of God has. So first one is this. How do you experience the love of God? You remember that Jesus walks with us, right? What did Jairus do? He said, hey, I need you to come with me. What did Jesus say? Yep, let's go, right? Jesus walks with you. Whatever your situation is, whether you're on the mountain or down in the valley, if you invite him to come, guess what he says? Yes. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and he will, say with me, be with you, right? Scripture, this is God speaking. He will be with you. He never leave or forsake you, right? He will never leave or forsake you. And because of that, he says what he says next, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And the truth is so many people are walking around alone and God's saying, stop it. Right? Just invite me to come. I want to walk with you. Second thing. Second thing. How do we experience God loves? You remember that Jesus stops for us. Right? And, and this, one, this one is a little more difficult because what happened? Jesus stopped for this woman on the way to do something else. Right? He was on the way to do something else. And how many of us are like, hey, God, we don't want to bother you, but... Or we see other people who are like, hey, we want to bear your burdens. We want to hear your brokenness. And we say the same thing. I don't want to be a burden. They're dealing with so much. Well, listen, we wouldn't invite you to do it if we didn't mean it. Right? We wouldn't invite you. And so here's what I got for you. If you feel like you are unlovable, guess what? Jesus stops for you. If you feel like you are not worthy to be loved, Jesus stops for you. If you think you failed beyond forgiveness... Jesus stops for you. If you feel like you were unseen, unknown, overlooked, and unheard of, Jesus stops for you. And if you reach out to Jesus, guess what? He's going to stop for you. He will walk with you. He's not just going to leave you behind. And that's the point we want you to know today. Right? He's stopping for you right now. Right? No matter where you are in life, he sees you. And he wants to be with you, right? He'll walk with you. And if he's walking with someone else, his love is so big, so amazing. If you ask him to stop, he's big enough to do both. That blows my mind. I don't even know how that's possible. But he's going to keep walking with you and he's going to stop and sit with me. Ask me how that makes any sense. I'm not smart enough to tell you, (laughs) except that it's big enough for it to happen. And then the third thing, right? Then the third thing, this is my favorite one is Jesus talks to us. Everyone in this woman's life overlooked her, unnoticed, abandoned, not cared for, and Jesus stops and calls for her intentionally. And then not only does he talk to her, but he talks to her and gives her exactly what she needs. He looks at her and he says, hey, no longer are you unnamed, unwanted, and unnoticed, but you are a daughter of God. You are loved, you are seen, you are valued. And she goes from just being another person in the crowd to being a daughter of the living God in a moment. In a moment. And that's the power of this lavish love, right? She's a child of God. And what he does for her, he will do for each and every one of us, right? And so I I got to this point in this story and I said, wait a second. What about the other daughter? (laughs) Like I got so caught up in this story. I was like, oh man, this is amazing that I forgot about Jairus' daughter. And I don't know if that's how your brains works. And I was like, man, this was amazing. He healed her. He called her daughter. She didn't belong, but she did. And he reminded her of it. And so I looked at this other part of this story. And again, that's when I started thinking, well, I, I can't ask God to do these things for me because so-and-so is battling something huge and my issue is just so small. So I'll just wait because God can't do both. Or if he's helping them, God's not going to do, do that for me, right? But he does everything. Look at how the story plays out. Verse 49. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and said, your daughter is dead. Uh, This is just a pause. If that ever happens, that's not the way to do it. Right? Hey, how are you? How are things going? We don't just lead with your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. And I want you to see that word teacher. This guy only sees Jesus as what? Teacher, what did Jairus see Jesus as? A healer. Watch what happens. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, right, before your mind can even start to doubt, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Now, why did Jesus stop? Because this is more than a verse. He just saw 
Jesus do something impossible. If Jesus would have never stopped, this conversation would have been much different. And so sometimes we get so mad. Come on, God, go my way, go my pace. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And Jesus says, hey, we're walking, we're not sprinting. And I need you to see this. Why? Because this is going to make this a whole lot easier to swallow. Could you imagine, hey, your daughter's dead. He's like, don't be afraid, man. I got this. But you just saw a daughter healed, right? Hey, daughter, go in peace. And Josh is thinking, oh, gosh, it's my turn. We're moving, we're moving. But while we're still talking, hey, your daughter is dead. Look at verse 51. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go with him except Peter, John, James, the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. And here's what happened when he's only a teacher to you. They laughed at him, knowing, right, knowing she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus said, go give her something to eat. That's a sermon for another day. Don't get me going. Last verse. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what happened. Right? And so some guys come up, hey, your daughter's dead. It's too late. She passed away. But when all hope is gone, right, when it seems like the end has arrived, when it seems like there's no way out, Jesus says, no, 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 don't you forget, I'm the author of time. I get to say when it's over, let's keep moving. And so your situation, it might be hopeless, right? Maybe it's a relationship. You're like, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe you've battled an addiction or maybe you're battling sickness. Maybe you're battling finances. Maybe you're like, I have this amazing situation, Jesus, but I just don't want to ask you about it because I know you're doing so many things. But his love is big enough and he's not done. And Jesus wants you to know, hey, you belong here. Just invite me to come and we will walk. We will stop where we're needed and we're going to talk all along the way. Reach out to him in your brokenness and believe, have faith that he can heal your wounds. And so as we wrap up, right, ask yourself, where have I been bleeding for 12 years? Right, where is life slowly draining away from me? that I need to ask God to step into. And whatever you find, right, whatever you find, bring it to him. Why? Because you know and believe his love is big enough to cover whatever is holding you back from belonging. Amen? Let's pray.